This episode of Breaking Walls is sponsored by... Are you a maker, doer, dreamer who enjoys their time alone? Who thrives on working solo? Then you might enjoy the Creative Introvert Podcast. Every week, I bring you musings, tips, and guest interviews in order to inspire and motivate my fellow creative innies. Find the show at thecreativeintrovert.com. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... What's up, guys? Welcome to Breaking Walls, episode number 57. My name is James Scully. Today on Breaking Walls, we'll examine the unique connection between radio during its golden age and Coney Island during the last of its heyday between the 1930s and the 1960s. Many of the original radio performers were vaudeville performers before radio began. In New York, while some found work on Broadway, others found their start at Coney Island. Similarly, during American radio drama's dying days of the late 1950s, Actors and actresses that would go on to achieve great fame in TV and movies hone their skills on radio. We'll examine some of those careers and listen to sound bites from the golden age of radio that took place at Coney Island. Before I go on, I just want to say that if this is the first time you're listening to Breaking Walls and would like to subscribe, please do so at iTunes by searching for Breaking Walls or by following us on SoundCloud at The Wall Breakers. To check out our line of New York City Unity t-shirts, please go to jamesthewallbreaker.com slash shop. These are typographic t-shirts that use the slang names of the five boroughs of New York City to help show unity amongst New Yorkers near and far. For those that do understand, no explanation is necessary. For those that do not understand what it means to be a New Yorker, no explanation, unfortunately, is possible. And we, The Wall Breakers, are on all social media outlets at The Wall Breakers, and we're on the web at thewallbreakers.com. Coney Island has been a place of amusement, budding romance, sex, drugs, and some of the highest highs and lowest lows. Its scents have been hot dogs, cigars, alcohol. Its sounds have been those of amusements, screams, laughter, transistor radios, and even a seemingly ageless fudgy wudgy salesman. Coney Island is part of the American lexicon. Steeplechase and Luna Park and Dreamland, the Cyclone, the Wonder Wheel, Dino's Astroland, Nathan's Hot Dogs, the New York Aquarium are just some of the institutions that come to mind when thinking about Coney Island. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Alan Ladd, Dorothy L'Amour, and Chester Morris in Coney Island. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. And step right this way for an hour of mirth and melody and romance. On the inside of this theater, a stupendous attraction. Straight from the bright lights of Hollywood. Not one, not two, but three glittering stars. Well, I'm afraid as a barker, I can't really do justice to my subject. But the simple facts are enough anyway. Because tonight, we bring you Alan Ladd, Dorothy L'Amour, and Chester Morris in the great 20th Century Fox musical hit, Coney Island. On summer days in 1944, as World War II drew to a close, Coney Island's beaches attracted hundreds of thousands of people each day. Steeplechase and Luna Park were both still open for business. Nathan's was celebrating its 28th year, and on April 17, 1944, on CBS radio, 
the Lux Radio Theater presented a dramatic adaptation of the 1943 film of the same name, Coney Island. The Lux performance starred Dorothy Lamar as Kate Farley in the female lead. She rose to fame in the Road to films that co-starred Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Chester Morris, famous as the original Boston Blackie, was Joe Rocco. Alan Ladd was Eddie Johnson. Four days after the production of this Lux Radio Theater episode, a film starring Ladd, China, would be released. His character in China became the inspiration for the Indiana Jones films. This play was set in the 1890s during the early days of Coney Island's peak as an entertainment hotspot. Eddie Johnson, always the smooth-talking con man played by Ladd, weasels his way into a job at friend and rival Joe Rocco's night spot where Eddie meets Joe's love interest and the club's confident and brash star attraction, Kate Farley. Eventually, Kate becomes the toast of Coney Island and her and Eddie fall in love. Joe then tries to sabotage their marriage plans. Today in New York, the closest spot to heaven, probably, is the top of the Empire State Building. But 40 years ago, New Yorkers came closest to paradise at a breeze-swept beach on the Atlantic Ocean. Only a short distance from the hot and throbbing city, they found a land whose milk and honey was clam chowder and steaming weenies. A place of perpetual carnival, of singing waiters and persuasive barkers. A little raucous, a little rowdy, but... Nevertheless, beautiful Coney Island. One spring afternoon, a young man named Eddie Johnson makes his first visit to Coney Island. Eddie has plans for a big business deal involving an old acquaintance, Joe Rocco, owner of the Scenic Gardens Cafe. Well, this is quite a surprise, Eddie. Yeah, a nice place you got here, Joe. A little different from those shooting galleries we used to have, huh, Eddie? Once we had a whole carnival, remember? Uh, vaguely. Yeah, then two years ago in St. Louis, we had an argument about how the carnival should be run. We decided to play a hand of poker for the whole works. <laughs> yes, and I won it with three of the prettiest aces you ever saw. Yeah, I've been trying to find you ever since, Joe. I, I wanted to give you these. I found them the next morning under the cushion of your chair. Four of the prettiest aces you ever saw. Well, Eddie, I, uh, I guess this makes up for all those times I went to the cash drawer and found your hand in it. Now, uh, now why don't we just forget the whole business, huh? Oh, I've tried to forget it, Joe. I've tried and tried. You're going to sue me? No, but I figure that since you cheated me out of our carnival, we're really still partners, and that means I own half of this joint. Well, uh, uh, there's just one hitch, Eddie. I, uh, I don't figure the same way. Well, in that case, I'll just have to worm myself in, Joe. One way or another. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, but I just got to pay you back, Joe. If I didn't, I'd lose all my self-respect. I just wanted to show you my new dress, Joe. How do you... Oh, it's all right, honey. The, the man's just leaving. This is Eddie Johnson, Kate Farley. She's, uh, she's my singer here. Oh, hello, Miss Farley. How do you do? Oh, the dress looks wonderful, Kate. Hey, we are. Look at the feathers. It'll be a nice dress when it gets through molding. Go on, Eddie. Push off. You, uh, you won't change your mind, huh? No, sorry. All right, suit yourself, Joe. Oh, uh, Miss Farley. Yes? When you take that dress off, you better hang it up in a birdcage. Listen, you smart aleck. I've had just With all about... those feathers, you know, it's liable to fly away. Goodbye, Miss Farley. Little did the world realize in 1944 that within 20 years, Coney Island would be forever changed. In order to tell that story, let's first go back to the beginning. In 1829, the Gravesend and Coney Island Road and Bridge Company built the first bridge spanning Coney Island Creek. This connected Coney Island with the mainland of Long Island. This was five years before the six towns of Bushwick, Brooklyn, Flatlands, Gravesend, Flatbush, and the Utrecht were chartered into the city of Brooklyn in 1834. After completing the bridge, the company then built Shell Road, connecting Long Island with Coney Island's shoreline. A portion of Shell Road still exists today. Finally, the company built the Coney Island House, the area's first hotel near present-day Seagate. By the 1840s, a small makeshift pier and a crew pavilion had been built, while hotel owner and politician Michael Norton sponsored a ferry that docked at today's Norton Point, home of the Coney Island Lighthouse today. Good night, 
Men sold clams on half shells to customers. On the beach, there were also less than honorable cards and dice games going on. And as you could imagine in this kind of environment, prostitution was rampant and murder wasn't totally uncommon. The eastern end of the island at today's Manhattan Beach consisted of small carved out sandy hills until carriage roads were built and steamship service that reduced travel time from a formerly half day journey to just two hours created an attractive environment for wealthy New Yorkers. In 1968, William A. Eggman built a 5,000-room middle-class resort on 39 lots. This resort was later given the name Brighton Beach. Resorts named the Manhattan Beach and the Oriental Hotel opened. Ocean Parkway was created in 1876. Even more importantly, just as elevated railroads were going up in Manhattan, they too were in Brooklyn, connecting the city of Brooklyn to Coney Island. The Coney Island and Brooklyn Railroad provided railway service along today's Coney Island Avenue. It operates today still as the B-68 bus. Andrew Culver created the West Brighton Culver Line, the southern portion of which retains its same route. And on July 2nd, 1878, the Brooklyn, Flatbush, and Coney Island Railway began operating. This railway follows the same route as today's BMT Brighton Line, which is still the only one of the subway lines terminating in Coney Island that first stops in Brighton Beach. artistic masterpieces. You see Gainsborough's blue boy talking things over with Whistler's mother. You see the leading tower of Pisa. Come in and marvel at this. But Cracky, look, this is Eddie. Eddie Johnson. Eddie, you old son of a gun. Frankie and Finnegan. Hey, you're looking great. Why not? He's preserved in alcohol. <laughs> not since the Chicago Fair have I looked upon you. Oh, Eddie. say this calls for a celebration. Yeah, but tell me, is, uh, is this your pitch? Yeah, I'm sorry to say it's mine. All mine. Well, what in the world are you doing at Coney Island? From the looks of business, nothing. Eddie, have you seen Joe yet? Joe Rocco? Yeah, I just came from there. Teaming up with Joe again, are you? No, not just yet, Finnegan. I'm looking for a new partner, Frankie. You interested? Eddie, I ain't got one. Only nine bucks for my name. Well, listen to me and you'll be rolling in dough. Huh? I've got an idea for a pitch that's worth a fortune. Well, that's great. Go and open it up, but let me alone. But every good location is taken. This would be just the spot for it, Frankie. Hurry, hurry, hurry. The only tattooed woman on Coney Island. Every time she shakes, moving pictures. Now, look, will you listen to me? We can have it ready in two days' time and for less than $300. But I just told you I got exactly I've got nine. the money. All I want from you is this location and your time. Eddie, you just made yourself a deal. After six months with Josephine, even suicide would look good to me. Come on, lads. Let's have a beer and talk it over. Dolly, will you look at that? What? That mob over there in front of Frankie's place. Oh, didn't you know? Frankie's got himself a new show and a new partner. That fellow doing the barking, huh? Oh, so that's Frankie's new partner, is it? Come on, Dolly. We're going over there. I said a show like that? You bet. Here's my chance to get even. Katie, you just don't make sense. I'll explain later. Come on. And it's only ten cents. Ten cents to see this daring exhibition of genuine Turkish harem girls. Hurry, hurry, hurry. See the young Turkish maiden sold to the sun for 20 pieces of silver. An authentic and educational exhibition with genuine oriental music is played by Abu Mandeb. A Turkish gentleman seated there before you on the Persian carpet. Listen, friends, listen to it. Why, that's Frankie, ain't it? Playing just like a snake charmer. Of course it is. He looks as much like a Turk as you do. Would you look at him buy those tickets? These guys are making a fortune. Stand back, Dolly. I'm going to go to work. Only eight seats left. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Oh, Frankie. Hello, Frankie. Yeah. Huh? Oh, hello, honey. Glad to see you. <laughs> I'm amazed, gents. Amazed. Abu arrived in this country only two days ago, and already he speaks a few words of English. <laughs> All right, little lady. Kindly move along now. Kindly move along. He used to talk to me plenty when we were working together over at the... Ixnay on the Akin Crane. Yes, Abu. Yasmeorum dastam bayuk. You do, huh? It's mesdin taplori pasuk. All right, Abu. I'll ask you. Young lady, Abu here can't figure out why you're wearing that atrocity on your head. He says it can't be a hat or can't. 
Abu says, did lady lose election bet or did lady fall into fruit salad? <laughs> Kate, we better get out of here. The nerve. The nerve of that bum. Wait till I tell Joe. Just wait. Why, the young lady is going away. Don't rush off, sweetheart. All right, boys. Hurry, hurry, hurry. The show starts in a second. Island's amusement park era began in 1876 when master carousel builder Charles I.D. Loof built an amusement ride at Vanderveer's bathhouse complex at West 6th and Surf Avenue. That same year, the centerpiece of the Philadelphia exhibition, a 300-foot steam elevator-powered observation tower, was moved to Coney. That tower was then the tallest structure in the United States. Just after the invention of the roller coaster in 1884, in 1885, a 7-story, 122-foot tall hotel in the shape of a colossal elephant, financed by James V. Lafferty, opened at the corner of Surf Avenue and West 12th Street. If you'd like to see its still standing older but smaller sister, head two miles south of Atlantic City, New Jersey to Margate City. In 1895, adventurer Paul Boynton opened the first enclosed amusement area, Sea Lion Park, just east of West 12th Street between Mermaid and Surf Avenues. Sea Lion Park only lasted eight seasons because in 1897, George C. Tillieu, who grew up in a family that ran a Coney Island restaurant, erected Steeplechase Park centered around a Ferris wheel and a mechanical Steeplechase horse racing ride. In 1903, two former employees of Tillyu's, Frederick Thompson and Elmer Skip Dundee, opened Luna Park on the site of the former Sea Lion Park and the Giant Elephant Hotel. Built on a grand scale, the park had over 1,000 red and white painted spires, minarets, and domes. Calling itself the heart of Coney Island, on the evening of May 16, 1903, Luna Park turned on its electricity, lighting up all of the domes, spires, and towers with over 250,000 electric lights. Think about that for a second. What would a person in 1903 think when seeing 250,000 electric lights? Many people still didn't have electricity in their homes, and even middle-class people had no more than a few light fixtures. Luna Park, lighting up the night skyline, could be seen all the way to Philadelphia. The next year, a third large-scale park called Dreamland opened up. Dreamland featured four times as many lights as Luna Park and an even bigger central tower, as well as attractions such as the End of the World, the Feast of Beshazzar and the Destruction of Babylon, and Lilliputia, a miniature village populated by little people. Brighton Beach, a racetrack opened in 1879, followed by Bryson Weber's Brighton Beach Casino, where Japanese waitresses in full traditional regalia served drinks to wealthy patrons. In 1905, Brighton's Pike Amusement Park opened. This park included a steel roller coaster. Now, for seven seasons, Coney Island's three big amusement parks simultaneously operated until about 1.30 in the morning on May 27, 1905. 
1911. That morning, Dreamland was undergoing final renovations for the opening of the new season. The ride that was getting the renovations was called Hellgate. At this ride, visitors took a boat on rushing waters through dim caverns made to feel like hell. While renovations were going on, light bulbs began to explode. In the excitement, a worker kicked over a bucket of hot tar, igniting Hellgate into flames. Many of the buildings in Dreamland were constructed using a combination of wood and plaster, two highly flammable materials. The entire park was soon engulfed in fire. The new high-pressure water pumping station constructed at 12th Street and Neptune Avenue just for something like this failed. Chaos ensued, animals escaped their cages, some on fire running into the streets. One lion which escaped to Surf Avenue named Black Prince had to be shot by police. By morning, the entire park was gone. On a positive note, the babies in Dreamland's famed incubator were in danger of perishing in the fire until the heroic efforts of Sergeant Frederick Klink of the NYPD, who made several trips into the burning structure to rescue the incubator babies. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the exciting drama of people who walk the great white way, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The afternoon sun strikes glints on Broadway's pavements, and the perfumes of summer drift in from meadows never known, from tropic seas that were never sailed, from green hills veiled in mist and imagined in childhood, drift and die against neon bled of its color. But the illusion still rides the silken vessel of a girl's summer frock, and the season dances in her slow, languid walk, and her passing is reflected in chrome and steel. There's a crowd between you and her, and there's loss. So walk away from it, kid, and order the beer and skim off the longing. Summer, too, will finally pass from Broadway. And for the policeman, there's this, the corridor to be walked, the corridor at whose end lie the anonymous dead, the unclaimed dead. Walk it and push open a swinging door that opens onto the city's morgue. Stand for a moment against the stillness and move into it. Over here, Danny. This one. What about him? Tell me in, Muggerman. It's a summer's day, Danny, and you and Don't I have to... Don't you about it, kid. Just tell me, huh? Well, this is the one they brought in yesterday, Danny. One those boys and girls found buried in the sand on Coney Island. When they dug him out, they also found a knife wound in his chest. Made them sad. They turned off the portable radio, stopped dancing. You identify him yet? Yeah, that's why I called you. All right, you called me. The man was in his beach trunks, no wallet on him, no bundle of clothes, not even a locker tag. You want me to compliment you on how hard you worked for his identity? Yeah, it would be nice. All he had was some numbers tattooed on his arm. Uh, the kind they were, their sequence, I figured they were social security types, so I checked the agency in Baltimore. They had him in their files. He used to work carnies. Just came in on the teletype. Who is he? A man by the name of Joey Croft now runs a palace of fun down in Coney. Him and a partner. I checked on the partner. They tell me a dish, Danny, a dish by the name of Letty Scott. You going to talk to her? Call me on a nice day, sure you will. And leave the place of the tagged and cataloged dead, the clean and quiet room where death is pigeonholed, accounts current for homicide. Leave there and out into beginning twilight and the drive now to Coney. And Coney Island on a mild summer's evening is carnival. Is pink cotton candy and things that spin and things that whirl. 
And Coney is ten shots for a quarter. And guess your weight. And down rushing rides. And carousel. Giddiness. Laughter. Hot dogs. Arcades. And little Egypt's oldest granddaughter. Ask a question of a man in a harlequin suit who needed a shave. And be directed to some steps. You are listening to an excerpt from CBS's Broadway Is My Beat, originally broadcast on June 23, 1952. This episode, the Joey Croft murder case, takes place in Coney Island. Broadway Is My Beat was a well-written and mostly unsponsored crime drama that was often preempted and ran on CBS from February 27, 1949 to August 1, 1954. In 1952, this episode aired on 9.30 p.m. on a Saturday night. Go ahead, do that. I'm his partner. He seems surprised he sees you sitting in his chair when he comes in. Say, Letty said you would do that. Joey's dead. He was found yesterday on the beach, Miss Scott, dead, stabbed to death. He's in the morgue. Honey, alone, will you? All right. Honey, alone. Stabbed? That's right. Murdered. What, a fight, an argument with somebody? Joey's temper... How? Who did it? I don't know. What about you? Are you kidding? Did you kill him? I'm a girl who used to ride elephants. That makes me kind to all animals and nearly all people. And I was real kind to Joey. I don't go around killing him. Where were you yesterday? Here, all day. I was here all day, mister. Listen, you, I can prove it. I did... What am I yelling for? Ask around. I was here all day. Let's assume that, Miss Scott. Let's assume you were here. You didn't kill Joey. Partner. You uh, must have known him pretty well. You just said it. I was his partner. What about it, then? Who didn't like him? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to get somebody in trouble because I knew Joey pretty well, and I'm going to miss Joey. Find yourself a boy named Fred Moore, and I'll tell you where to find him. Who's Fred Moore? He once worked here in a clown suit on his way to being a geek. Stole some dough. Joey screamed. They took off Fred's clown suit and dressed him like they do in Danamora. Fred got three years. Now he's out. You said you knew where to find him. Where? Seagirt. I took a walk down there a week or so ago. Saw Fred sitting on a porch, rocking in a chair. The hotel there. The ocean rest. He waved to me. I waved to him. He got up from his rocker. I walked away fast. Ask him what you asked me. Ask him did he kill Joey Croft. And tell her you'll do that when you find him. And tell her to stay close to her palace of fun. All hers now. No partners. Because you'll want her to be there if there's need to come back. And leave her. Leave the taunting that lies close on her lips and changes color as neon Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Autolite brings you a story of treachery and greed. A story we call Murder in G-Flat. Starring Mr. Jack Benny. Interestingly enough, on April 5th, 1951, Suspense, nicknamed Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills, broadcast an episode on CBS called Murder in G-Flat which starred comedian Jack Benny. The crime thriller play had bit parts featuring Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor and Jack Crucian as their show characters. Portions of Murder in G-Flat center around Coney Island. You're always right with Autolite. And now with Murder in G-Flat and the transcribed performance of Mr. Jack Benny, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. A lieutenant in here, sir, in the rec hall. What's he doing in the rec hall? Well, he thought he'd tune the piano while I was waiting, lieutenant. Sunday night. Why couldn't you guys pick a better night than Sunday night? My one day off, and I have to come down Sorry here. Sorry we had to call you, Joe. This is the guy, huh? Yeah. Hey, you. That's it. C. Plant. I had my wrench. This yeah. is the lieutenant. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I Same? Was... Oh. My name is Remington. Hercules Remington. That's it, Joe. We checked. Huh. Uh, pardon me, Lieutenant, but my wife, Martha, is going to be awfully worried. You see, I haven't seen her since this morning. 
They told you. Have you seen your wife since this morning? No, and I thought that if I could phone her and at least tell her where I am... Where'd you pick him up? Coney Island, Joe. He called us from there. Yes, and I should have called my wife, too. Look, Lieutenant, I don't want to seem persistent about this. You'll have plenty of time later to call your wife. Now, give the Lieutenant the story in detail, just like you told it to me on the way down here to the station. What kind of work do you do, Remington? Well, I'm a a piano tuner, Lieutenant. Yours is out of tune. C flat, Lieutenant. See, if I could get my bag, I'd do... Look, Remington, I haven't got all night. Now, either get on with your story or I'll have... All right, Lieutenant. But... But I really would like to call my wife first. Start your story. All right. All right. But if there's any explaining to be done to my wife, uh, you guys will have to do it. We'll be happy to. Now, go ahead. Yes, sir. Well, Lieutenant, this whole mess started yesterday morning, Saturday. I got up, had breakfast with my wife, Martha, and my Uncle Herman. He's my black sheep uncle of the family. He's a carnival man, came to work at the World's Fair here, and has been living with us ever since. I think he ought to pay at least one-third of the rent, but Martha, well, she feels sorry for him. Anyway, I left the house around 10 o'clock on my way to the Lippenridge School of Music. I usually tune their pianos on the first Saturday of the month. You see, because there aren't any classes there on that Saturday. I catch the BMT at 57th and get off at Union Square. Well, yesterday morning, I got on the subway, just like I always do. I carry a little ordinary brown bag with all my tools in it and usually lay it right next to me under the seat. I was just sitting there, thinking hard, wondering how I was going to meet the bills at the end of the month when a man sat down next to me. He shoved something under the seat and just sat there staring ahead. B flat, D flat, B flat, D flat, B flat, B flat. I beg your pardon. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I guess I got carried away for a moment. Four stops later, the man got up, reached under the seat, pulled out a little brown bag, and started for the door. I remember noticing he was bald headed and wearing big black horn rimmed glasses. For a minute, I thought he'd stolen my bag of tools, but I reached my hand under the seat and found my bag was still there. I remember sort of chuckling to myself, thinking of the coincidence that he'd been carrying the same type of bag. Well, anyway, I got off at Union Square and walked up to the Lippenridge School of Music on 14. There are four floors there, you know, a piano on each floor, and I usually start at the top and work my way down. Well, since the school doesn't have any classes on Saturday, the the place was deserted. Hmm, that one's sour. Yeah, D flat. I'll soon have that in shape. What the... I zipped open my bag to take out my tuning hammer and my wedges, but... but there were no tools in my bag. The tools were gone, and in their place were bundles and bundles of crisp $10 bills. And then it hit me. The little bald-headed man on the subway. The man who sat down next to me. This bag belonged to him. He picked up mine by mistake. There was no name on the bag, no identification of any kind. I started counting one of the bundles. Each bundle contained $1,000 in $10 bills, and there were 25 bundles. I had just come heir to opened his hot dog shop on the corner of Stillwell and Surf Avenue in 1916. Child's Restaurant was constructed in 1917. Finally, the Shore Theater opened in 1925. By 1929, the old Coney Island railways were upgraded to be part of the New York City subway system. Millions of people streamed through on a yearly basis. Coney Island's nightlife was booming.
On October 24th, 1929, the stock market crashed, sending the entire country into a Great Depression. This depression hit Luna Park and much of Coney Island's entertainment and amusement district hard. At the same time, Parks Commissioner Robert Moses began to construct the Belt Parkway and open Jones Beach and Jacob Reese Park. New Yorkers with money could afford to drive elsewhere. Poor New Yorkers couldn't afford the amusements. As the money fled Coney Island, the crime and vice became uncovered and grew further. Half abandoned streets, the nature of the lower end of the entertainment industry itself, cavernous amusement rows, and the tight network of streets made for a good place for a crime empire. <coughs> Hello, I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Yes, this is the crime club. I'm the librarian. Coney Island Nocturne. Yes, we have a story for you. Come right over. <laughs> easy chair by the window. Comfortable? The manuscript is on this shelf. Here it is, Coney Island Nocturne, the very absorbing story of fingers that were nailed by death. Let's look at it under the reading lamp. When Mike Donahue brought Helen O'Malley to Coney Island for an evening of fun, he had only the best intentions. Naturally, he was an officer of the law, a detective. And she was his fiancée. But three hours later, they stood in the middle of a crowded, noisy carnival street. They were faced with a crisis of catastrophic proportions. Mike, I'm afraid I'll never understand you. How many times have I told you never to keep your wallet in your hip pocket? Yeah. If you were just another palooka who didn't know any better, then, well, all right. But you're a member of the pickpocket squad. You're supposed to know. Yeah. Haven't you got anything to say? How much money have you got on you? Enough to get us home. Helen, you're not going to tell the boys at the station house. No, dear. I still expect to marry you someday. I want congratulations, not sympathy. Yeah, well... Hey, Mike. Uh, hmm? Who was that? Look over there, honey, and you'll see a character. Hiya, Mike. I never thought I'd be glad to see you. Benny Good. You recognize me, don't you? Let me over, pal. I've done a 60-day stretch in a workhouse, and I ain't a bit tired. <laughs> what are you doing down here, Benny? You thought your territory was Times Square. I got a job. I'm going straight, Mike. You don't say. Yep. I got fed up looking through bars. So now I'm a barker for a show up the street. Hey, who's the, uh, tomato? Helen O'Malley, chipmunk. Do you consider me fruit or vegetable? Huh? Oh, <laughs> It's a riot, Mike. Is it uh, permanent? Put your hands behind your head, Benny. What? I'm going to frisk you. Now, do you want to put him up, or do I have to coach you? I put him up. You can cut nothing on me. I'm on a level now, Mike. You're an old-time pickpocket, Benny. You know where you cops make a label stick. Once a crook, always a crook. Crime Club was broadcast on the Mutual Broadcasting System from December 2nd, 1946 through October 16th, 1947. Coney Island Nocturne, this episode was broadcast on Thursday, July 10th, 1947 at 10 p.m. Barry Thompson played the librarian. This is the worst part of going to Coney Island, the ride home in the subway. Yeah. Oh, well, Benny's confession sort of makes it worthwhile. Imagine that chipmunk having the whole thing planned from the beginning, yeah. picking your pocket and then asking us to meet him on the beach where he'd left Maggie Blake's dead body. What a character. And all for a few measly dollars. 30000 I even thought he'd get away with it. You'd suspect Josie and Pete Johnson of Maggie's murder and he'd be... Mike, you didn't tell me how he got to Pete to kill him. I guess I'll have to, won't I? Well, he followed them to their apartment after they left the office. Yes. Then he phoned Josie and told her to help him frame Pete. She came back to the palace looking for me. Well, the rest is history. Yes, but Mike, what made you suspect Benny? Two things, sweetheart. Josie had a chance to kill me and didn't. And Benny going for the money in the wall. Eh, uh, can I go to sleep now, dear? One more thing. What happened to Josie? She was picked up. Now, darling. All right, honey. Mike. Hmm? Is this your wallet? Where'd you get it? Out of your hip pocket. For a member of the pickpocket squad, you are about the easiest pickings I've ever known. Good night, dear. 
In 1944, Luna Park was badly damaged by fire. Robert Moses had the land rezoned to allow residential apartments to be built on its site. In 1949, he moved the boardwalk back from the beach several yards, demolishing many structures, including the city's municipal bathhouse. He would later demolish several blocks of amusements to clear land for both the New York Aquarium and the Abe Stark ice skating rink. More land was taken by Moses than needed, and for decades, much of the land surrounding the boardwalk at Coney Island was a mess of vacant, weed-overgrown lots. The changes brought into America by the end of World War II affected both Coney Island and the American radio drama in similar ways. The GI Bill and the rapid affordability of the automobile, as well as the newly created highway system, helped people move out of the urban environments on the go, going places into newly created suburban homes. In these homes, they watched television. Street gangs moved into Coney Island, and what remained of the amusement district, which at this point amounted to Steeplechase Park, became a seedy environment. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. One of the greatest pleasures we find in this business of keeping you in suspense is the discovery of new talent and of unusual story twists. And what you're about to hear, we think we have combined both. The twist, you'll never guess it, no matter how familiar you are with that mystical literary device, the ventriloquist dummy. And the new talent, two young men, Bob Jorn, whose first radio play this is, and DeForest Kelly, a bright new luminary in the Hollywood firmament who is presently being seen as Morgan Earp in Gunfight at O.K. Corral. Put them all together, and you have a strange half hour ahead. Listen. Listen, then, as DeForest Kelly stars in Flesh Peddler, which begins in exactly one minute. This is an episode of Suspense, originally broadcast on August 4th, 1957, during radio's dying days. The play was called Flesh Peddler. It stars DeForest Kelly, seven years before he achieved fame as Dr. Bones McCoy on Star Trek. A flesh peddler is a derogatory term for an agent, especially a low-rent carnival agent. This episode takes place amongst the remains of the sideshow carnival industry. Notice how much lower this episode of Suspense production value was when compared to the episode that starred Jack Benny just six years before. The end was near for both the American radio drama and the Coney Island amusements. It is the mild Kent cigarette smoke Kent. Smoke Kent. Smoke Kent with the Micronite filter. And now. Mr. DeForest Kelly in Flesh Peddler, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I'm an agent, a booking agent. Flesh peddlers, we are sometimes unkindly called. But I don't peddle flesh. I sell talent, singers, musicians, nightclub acts. And I'm pretty good at it. I've got an instinct for talent. When I find a new act that's really got it, I go after it until it's mine. Only the ventriloquist team of Wilson and Oliver. I wish I'd never heard of them. Then I could sleep better nights. I don't want to sound like a snob. But to me, the carnival is the lowest form of show business. I hate them. But my wife, Gloria, loves them. Since I love Gloria... We went to the carnival. Pete, isn't it exciting? It's just cheap noise. Oh, I wish it had come to town sooner. I wish it hadn't come till tomorrow. Oh, come on, Pete. You might even find some new talent. Here? Why not? Freaks are for sideshows, honey, not class spots. You never can tell. A bearded lady might go great at the coca. I can tell. Right here for the wonder of the midway. Hey, the one and only Alexander Wilson and his lovable little dummy pal, Oliver. Hey, you've seen Ben Benefis before, you say. Uh-huh. Hey, but you've never seen anything to equal Wilson. The remarkable Wilson and Oliver. Hey, don't pass this by, friends. 
He did go in. Oh, but it's Philquist, a dime a dozen. Come on, I want to see him. Honey, you've seen a hundred just like him. Well, maybe he's one in a hundred. All right, all right. We pushed through into the small tent and took our places on the hard, uncomfortable benches. Wilson was already seated on the platform, a typical childishly dressed dummy on his lap. He was a man in his fifties, I'd say, with the saddest face I've seen in 15 years of show business. When the people were in, he suddenly sprang the dummy to life. Shut the doors! Shut the doors! All prisoners accounted for, Mr. Wilson. You're sure, Oliver? Sure. But then... Say hello to the people. Hello to the people. Oh, now, come, Oliver. You can do better than that. I can? Yes. Well, you ought to know. (laughs) (laughs) The routine was awful. Dull, time-worn. But for some reason, this Wilson fascinated me. He had a talent, all right. His handling of the dummy was amazingly accurate. As the act went on, I began to think that Wilson was even better than the Barker said he was. And he was going over with the house. Wilson had Oliver sing while he himself smoked a cigarette. After a few more gag routines and a couple of neat tricks, the performance was over, and I knew I had to sign the act. I parked Glory on the merry-go-round and then went looking for Wilson. I walked back of the midway through the maze of painted trailers that were home to Carney people. Suddenly the door to one of them flew open and a woman stepped out, a neatly trimmed beard covering her chin. What do you want? I'm looking for Alexander Wilson. Wilson? Why? I'm a talent agent from New York. I'd like to talk to him. Agent? Yes, Peter Harris, and you're... Bernice, it's on the posters. Oh, yes, of course, Bernice. What do you want with Alexander Wilson? I told Uh, you I... Who is it, Bernice? Talent agent. Never mind, go back in. Uh, 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 agent? I'm looking for Mr. Wilson. Oh, uh, well, I'm Arthur. Uh, you caught my knife act. You you know, I I could pin a fly to a penny of four feet. Quiet. Don't mind him, flesh peddler. Go away. Go home. Agents are no good for us. Leave Wilson alone. And, and you know, uh, like I could put out a candle flame with a pen knife at 30 feet, Agent Man. Arthur? And go back in. Uh, uh, maybe he could sell my act. Go in. All right. Uh, Wilson's in trailer 17, Agent Man. Hey, if you ever need a... a Shut good up, night, Arthur. George. Shut up. Get in there. Forget what he said. Arthur is... Well, he isn't quite bright. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's so wrong about seeing Wilson? There are plenty of acts like his. You don't need him. Well, you've got my curiosity going now, Bernice. I hadn't intended that. But forget your curiosity. And go home. Now. Why? Believe me, flesh peddler, you will thank me for this advice someday. Which is trailer 17? On September 20th, 1964, Steeplechase, the last of Coney Island's three great amusement parks, finally closed. Marie Tillieu, the daughter of George C. Tillieu, sold the land to real estate developer Fred Trump. The abandoned park sat for two years in stillness before being bulldozed in 1966. Trump sold the undeveloped site to the New York City government in 1969. The closing of Steeplechase Park, along with urban renewal housing project development in the surrounding neighborhood of Coney Island, created a situation in which fewer people were visiting the area. Many amusement owners abandoned their properties. In the late 1970s, the city came up with a plan to revitalize Coney Island by bringing in gambling casinos, as had been done in Atlantic City. Unfortunately, the city's plans backfired because a prospective casino created a land boom. The old amusement properties were bought up and cleared in anticipation. Gambling, however, was never legalized in Coney Island, and the entire area became vacant, overgrown lots, leaving the west end of Coney Island completely devoid of amusement for the first time in a hundred years. People were, however, still visiting the beaches in the summer, and the Steeplechase Coney Island Pier at West 17th Street was still a popular fishing point and a destination for couples. Hot dog, here they are, genuine Coney Island hot dog. Get your red hot dog. Eddie, 
What in the world are you doing out here? Hello, Kitty. Well, I could ask the same question. At 9 o'clock at night, you should be tending to business. By the way, how is the new place? Oh, fine. I'd like you to see it. Maybe later, Eddie. You see, I got a telegram from Joe. He said to meet him on the Coney Island Pier at 9 o'clock Sunday night. Well, here I am. Uh, that's funny. I, I got a telegram, too. Joe? No, from the city hall. Something about my license not being legal after tomorrow. Said a man would be here to see me about it at 9 o'clock. It sounds awful phony to me. Some amateur is trying to pull a fast one. Yeah, sure. I just opened, opened it up. It, the license is good for a whole year. Listen. Somebody's having a good time. Yeah. Moonlight picnic on the beach, remember? We were going to do that one day. Katie, do you think that... Hot dogs, Coney Island caviar. Oh, hello, Eddie. Hot dog. Sure, why not? Katie? I'll take a bite of yours. With mustard, Mac. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. Hot dog, get your Coney Open your mouth. Mmm. Delicious. You got mustard all over. I'll lick it off. Mmm. I, uh, I know a better way to take mustard off. You do? Uh-huh. This way. Oh, my, that's a wonderful way, Eddie. Hey, look, uh, how long do I have to stand here watching this? Joe. Oh, uh, hello, Joe. Hello, Eddie. Now, uh, about that license. Oh, uh, so you sent the telegram. I might have known. Sure, it expires tomorrow. Your, uh, your marriage license. Oh, well, thanks for reminding me. No, that license cost Eddie a dollar, Katie. Be ashamed to see that buck wasted. And now, in case you two are interested, there's a preacher waiting in my office. The service always was pretty good at your cafe, Joe. Mm -hmm. Well, Miss Farley, uh, can you spare the time to get married? Uh, how long does the marriage take? This one? Uh, about 50 years, I hope. I think I can just about make it. Well, what are you waiting for? Oh, Eddie, just a minute. Uh-oh, now what? Mustard all over your face. In just a moment, our stars will return for a curtain call. Did you ever try to describe something in music? And in the end, both Coney Island and radio drama are proving that what's old eventually becomes new again. In the last two decades, Coney Island has experienced an economic upturn. The Brooklyn Cyclones, a Class A affiliate of the New York Mets, began their existence in 2001 after Keyspan, now MCU, Park, opened on part of the site of Steeplechase Park in Coney Island. The park also recently has become the home field of the reborn New York Cosmos of the North American Soccer League. Likewise, there has been huge growth in podcasts as smartphones and digital devices and platforms like iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict give people access to content free from the over-the-air AM-FM frequency restrictions and regulations. It only seems like a matter of time before a new radio drama boom occurs in the form of transcribed, on-demand podcasts. Another wonderful thing, digital audio has helped save more old-time radio dramas than ever before. There are tons of podcasts that play old-time radio shows, and if you're interested in browsing titles or learning more, I go to the Old Time Radio Researchers Library at otrlibrary.org. If you're interested in learning more about Coney Island's history, I'd start with Rick Burns' 1991 American Experience PBS documentary called Coney Island. It's available on YouTube for free. Anybody can search for it and watch it. I'd also check out the Coney Island History Project at coneyislandhistoryproject.org or the Coney Island Circus Sideshow at coneyisland.com. Today's musical credits are as follows. Coney Island Baby was performed by The Excellence. Shine On Harvest Moon was performed by Joan Morris and William Bulcom. Meet Me Tonight in Dreamland was by Beat Circus. Nutcracker Sweet Opus 71A Arabian Dance Coffee was performed by Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops Orchestra. The old-time radio shows featured in today's episode were The Lux Radio Theater's Coney Island, originally broadcast Monday, April 17, 1944, on CBS. Crime Club's Coney Island Nocturne, originally broadcast Thursday, July 10, 1947, on the Mutual Broadcasting System. Oddly enough, the day that that was broadcast was the same day folk singer Arlo Guthrie was born in Coney Island. Broadway is My Beat, the episode was called The Joey Croft Murder Case, originally broadcast Monday, June 23, 1952, on CBS. And finally, Two episodes of Suspense, Murder in G-Flat, originally broadcast Thursday, April 5th, 1951, and Flesh Peddler, 
originally broadcast Sunday, August 4th, 1957. Both episodes aired on CBS. All of these episodes are available online and can be searched for and listened to in their entirety. As I mentioned on the opening, if you've gotten this podcast via thewallbreakers.com or some other web means and would like to subscribe, you can do so via iTunes by searching for Breaking Walls and via SoundCloud at The Wallbreakers. The Wallbreakers Unity t-shirt line is available either at jamesthewallbreaker.com slash shop or simply thewallbreakers.com slash shop. Spring is in full bloom and soon the beaches will be open for summer. That's part of why this episode came at this point in time. I'm hoping that you guys are feeling good about where your life is currently situated and if I can do anything to help, please reach out to me at jamesthewallbreaker.com. I'm more than happy to listen and try to connect people with other people or help myself. Outside of that, Keep getting out there, guys. Keep breaking those walls. My name is James Scully. This has been Breaking Walls, episode number 57. And until June 1st, I'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you very much. tiny orbs of light search the sky from east to west she's the brightest and the best but she's so far above me I know she cannot love me still I love her and more than all the rest
This is WBBN, the Wallbreakers Broadcasting Network. Thank you, and good afternoon.